All right, welcome everyone. We're going to kick off our webinar today. Um, welcome and thank you so much to everyone for joining the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership for today's webinar, SARS-CoV-2 and Zoo Animals. This webinar is presented in partnership with the One Health Federal Interagency COVID-19 Coordination Groups, Zoo and Wildlife Subgroups. I'm Haley Randall, the Program Assistant for the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership. Before we begin, I'm gonna go through a few logistical reminders with all of you. As a disclaimer, while this webinar is being publicly broadcast and will be publicly available as a recording, materials used in this webinar are not intended for distribution purposes. Some information presented is in pre-publication and has not been formally published or peer-reviewed, and we ask you to please not reuse or circulate this information. All participants are currently muted and in listen-only mode. Attendees are invited and encouraged to participate by using the Q&A feature to submit questions for panelists. The Q&A session will take place at the end of this webinar. You should be able to see that we will be enabling live transcription um, for this webinar. To disable this feature, view a full transcript in a separate window or change the settings, click the caret next to live transcript at the bottom of your screen and we'll, we will be enabling live transcription momentarily. Presentation portions of this webinar are being recorded and will be posted to our website, zap.org, within three business days. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Sharon Deem, Director of the St. Louis Zoo Institute for Conservation Medicine and Vice President of the American Association of Zoo Veterinarians to kick us off. Turning it over to you, Dr. Deem, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Haley, for the introduction. A special thanks to this amazing group of panelists for giving their expertise and time. And thanks to all of you for attending this important webinar in which a main focus is to share best practices on protecting humans and animals from SARS-CoV-2. And it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you and to start the webinar with a few words. So. It's probably safe to say that we are all familiar with COVID-19 as the two-year mark of this tragic global pandemic approaches. During these months, we've learned a great deal about SARS-CoV-2, the virus, biological and epidemiological realities, as well as human behaviors, as all these relate to how we may be able to minimize the impacts of this zoonotic pandemic. We also know that while the virus responsible for COVID-19 originated in a non-human animal, it was able to spill over into the human population where it has proven to be very human adapted and primarily causing disease in humans. However, there are many examples of the virus being able to spill back from humans into non-human animal host. The first stories of human to animal viral movement were of outbreaks at mink farms and more recently concerns of exposure and free living white tailed deer here in the US. As we will hear in this webinar domestic and non domestic animals in human care have been exposed infected and have even suffered morbidity and mortality so sickness and death from the spillback of SARS CoV 2 from humans to animals. But I also hope it's very evident during this webinar and as we move forward that you see how closely and carefully the health of zoo animal populations, how the health is monitored and delivered. And this includes daily assessments of caretakers, preventative medicine programs such as diagnostic testing capabilities and vaccinations, 24-7 access to veterinary care, and pathological services for anti-mortem and post-mortem evaluations. Zoo veterinarians, other zoo staff members, and allied organizations such as the Centers for Disease Control and the U.S. Geological Survey National Wildlife Health Center, working together, we can prevent and mitigate impacts of this disease on the health of the animals for which we care. And Although this is a rapidly changing situation, as Omicron have reminds us, today's panelists will share the most current data on SARS-CoV-2 infections in zoos, and most importantly, will share the best practices on protecting humans and animals from SARS-CoV-2. So now it's my great pleasure to hand the mic over to Dr. Jonathan Sleeman, Center Director of the U.S. Geologic Survey, National Wildlife Health Center, Take it away, Dr. Sleeman. 
Great. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Very much appreciate your opening remarks. And I'd just like to also express my appreciation to the AZA uh, for hosting this, this webinar. So in, in addition to my, to my daytime job as Senate Director for the National Wildlife Health Center, I'm also chair of the One Health Federal Interagency COVID-19 Coordination Group, the Zoom Wildlife Subgroup. And, and that's the main uh, group that has helped put together a lot of the presentations here today. Uh, it really has been a very good collaboration between ourselves, CDC, um, uh, AAZV, AZA, uh, and other agencies. I'm just gonna very briefly um, share my screen um, just to show you the, the, the agenda for today. Um, as, as Dr. Dean mentioned, we're gonna have some opening presentations, kind of giving an overview of the current situation regarding SARS-CoV-2 infection in, in, in animals under human care. Then we'll talk about the preventive measures, the, the current uh, TAG recommendations, some case examples, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll try and leave as, as much time as we can for, 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 for questions and answers. So without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first two speakers. Uh, Dr. Ria Guy from the CDC and Dr. Karen Terrio uh, from the University of Illinois. They'll be giving us a presentation on, on setting the scene and overview of the current situation regarding SARS-CoV-2 and, and, and zoos. So Ria, I think you're up first. If you wanna go ahead and um, share your slides. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Sleeman. So as Dr. Sleeman mentioned, my name is Ria Guy. I'm a doctoral epidemiologist with the One Health Office um, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, also just wanted to express my gratitude for AZA and SAP for being able to present here today and share some of the things that we've learned about SARS-CoV-2 in zoos, sanctuaries, and aquaria to date. So I know we all know this, um, but zoos provide obviously many benefits to people and animals. Um, they deliver educational programs, support conservation, and they help us to learn more to protect endangered species and improve biodiversity. And they also conduct research to learn about animals, often generating knowledge that would otherwise be impossible to gather um, in wild animal populations. But of course, we know that unfortunately, zoo animals, sanctuary animals, and aquaria animals haven't escaped the effects of COVID-19. Um, so we all know, and to everyone's surprise at the time, in the United States, tigers and lions at a zoo in New York were actually the first animals that were identified as positive for SARS-CoV-2. And over the subsequent year and a half, we've identified really quite a diverse range of animals that have been infected with the virus, both in the United States and globally. Um, animals that have been affected at zoos include big cats, uh, like lions, tigers, cougars, fishing cats, snow leopards, and many other species including hyenas, gorillas, Asian small clawed otters, coatis, and binturong. While SARS-CoV-2 infections have been detected in zoo animals in over 30 countries to date, many of these animals, including hyena, fishing cats, binturong, and coatis, to name a few, have recently been identified in zoos here in the United States within just the past few months. Um, just this week, actually, news broke that two hippopotamus have tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 at a zoo in Antwerp, Belgium, uh, Belgium after showing signs of uh, mucousy nasal discharge. So these are just a few of the species shown on this slide that might be part of zoological collections, um, but have not yet been detected in zoo sanctuaries and aquaria. So these include animals like ferrets, mink, and white-tailed deer, which we know to be highly susceptible to the virus. And we therefore wanted to include them in this slide as kind of our list of species of concern. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is to address the growing number of SARS-CoV-2 cases and outbreaks among zoo animals in the United States. So in recent months, you may have noticed that there's been an uptick in the number of media articles pertaining to zoo animals, 
Some document new species uh, that have become infected, in infections in threatened or endangered species, and others describe more severe illness or even death in zoo animals. So during this webinar, our intention is to provide information on what we know about SARS-CoV-2 at zoos, introduce, introduce both new and existing resources to assist you in preventing and responding to SARS-CoV-2 at your facilities, and to really have a discussion with you about additional support or needs that you may have. So I'm gonna begin with sharing some of the data that we have at the national level. Um, and I'll just preface this by saying that these data were really collected in collaboration with a number of partners, including USDA, state and local health authorities, and staff at affected facilities. So the first piece of data that I'd like to show you is this histogram, which um, shows the animals that have been reported as SARS-CoV-2 positive since the beginning of the pandemic. So the number of cases is reported on the y-axis and the month is on the x um, since February of 2020. And this histogram really reflects companion animals, zoo animals, and wildlife. Um, but it doesn't actually include one other important animal demographic, which are mink on farms, where there have been outbreaks of over 440 mink farms in 12 countries. So to orient you a little more to this figure, each animal group has a corresponding colored group. So companion animals are shown in shades of red, orange, and yellow and zoo animals are shown in shades of blue and green, while wildlife are shades of purple. So as this figure shows, the majority of infected animals that we know of to date, um, other than mink, of course, have been companion animals, which take up about 36% for cats and 33% of all known animal SARS-CoV-2 infections in the US for dogs. Um, however, if we focus specifically on what's been happening since July of this year, which um, you can now see in the area highlighted by the rectangle, you can see that there's been a bit of a switch from a predominance in companion animal cases to zoo, sanctuary, and aquaria animal cases, with the most common being lions and tigers. I would like to note that this uptick does correspond with a rise in the Delta variant of concern within the human population. Um, and that since July, all zoo animal infections where a sequence has been able to be generated has been um, infections with the Delta variant. We are continuing, of course, to, to analyze our data to determine if we can detect signal that might indicate that the Delta variant is more transmissible to some animals. Um, but as of yet, we don't have any significant difference in the number of animal type, or sorry, the number of animals um, infected with wild type lineages versus those infected with alpha or delta. The next figure I'd like to show you is a map um, which really highlights the geographic distribution of the 120 zoo, sanctuary, and aquaria animals that have been confirmed positive with SARS-CoV-2. And this has been at 32 zoos, sanctuaries, and aquaria across 22 different states. One thing to note is that um, these numbers reflect only animals that were confirmed positive for SARS-CoV-2 at USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratories. However, we do know that in many instances, other animals sometimes residing in the fame, same family groups, for example, were considered infected, but weren't actually confirmed at NVSL. So we, we do know that this number is certainly an underestimation of all known cases. Nevertheless, you can see from the icons that these cases have spanned six mammalian families of Philidae, Hominidae, Hyenidae, Mustelidae, Procyonidae, and Viveridae. And perhaps one salient lesson that I'd like to point out from this slide is that we have learned really a tremendous amount about the diversity of animal species that can be naturally infected with the virus, which indicates its overall host range. And that's really been gained by studying cases and outbreaks in these zoos, sanctuaries, and aquaria. 
Um, and of course, with that comes the corresponding conservation concerns we've learned about associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection in the world's threatened and endangered wildlife. Next, um, I wanted to show you some of the data we have on how zoo, sanctuary, and aquaria animals um, have presented clinically with SARS-CoV-2. So looking on the left side of the slide, 84% um, of all animals have had clinical signs of some sort, while 2% have been entirely asymptomatic, and the remaining 14% are unknown. I would like to point out, though, that the clinical presentation data that we have in animals is likely affected by how we detect infections in these settings. So currently there's very few active surveillance programs in effect. So we're likely to be missing a large tranche of animals that did not display clinical signs or displayed very mild uh, clinical signs that quickly abated. In contrast, most of the animals that have been detected have been um, detected through passive surveillance mechanisms, meaning that an animal became sick with clinical signs, those clinical signs overlapped or were consistent with SARS-CoV-2, they were tested and found to be positive. That caveat aside, if we do move to the right side of the slide, um, here we're focusing specifically on those 84% of animals that did have clinical signs. And we can look a little bit deeper at what those clinical signs actually are. So overwhelmingly, um, clinical signs have tended to be respiratory, which is shown in blue here. And that's primarily cough and nasal discharge, although we do see other clinical signs as well, including ocular discharge, sneezing, and shortness of breath. Um, in pink, you see some nonspecific clinical signs that are also common, including lethargy and lack of appetite. And then finally, gastrointestinal signs in orange, including uh, diarrhea and vomiting, are less common, but they have been observed. And just one note here, um, all data have been summarized across all species, but of course, Due to the large number of cases in big cats, um, that's really the animal group that is driving some of these data. Finally, I'd like to talk briefly about the epidemiologic information that we've learned through One Health investigations at zoo sanctuaries and aquaria. So primarily, I'd like to focus on how these animals became exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in the first place. So in 55% of all epidemiologic case investigations um, that have been conducted to date, a human with COVID-19 was identified as the likely source of infection. In nearly all of those investigations, this person was a caretaker that worked closely with the animals and was responsible for feeding, training, and other routine care. In many instances, um, these caretakers were entirely in asymptomatic, and in others, they became symptomatic while at work before they could isolate. In investigations where sequence data were available um, for both the caretakers and the exposed animals, we've seen that sequences um, do match quite closely um, if they're not identical altogether with um, infected animals. In 23% of investigations, um, no person could be identified as positive for COVID-19 within a time frame that um, may have precipitated animal infection. So oftentimes staff and volunteers were screened and were all negative for COVID-19. So in those instances, other sources of exposure, such as indirect exposure through contaminated food or potentially even the public, um, have been considered as possible other sources. Finally, in 21% of cases, rigorous investigation couldn't be conducted and the source of exposure is therefore unknown. One salient point in recent investigations that I'd like to bring up is that SARS-CoV-2 infections have occurred despite caretakers and other zoo staff wearing masks, being vaccinated, and taking biosecurity and biosafety uh, precautions quite seriously. In fact, nearly all of our investigations have shown us the rigorous practices that zoos, sanctuaries, and aquaria have put into place 
to protect the health of their animals and to pretend, prevent the introduction of SARS-CoV-2. Yet we do still see these infections continuing to occur and the pandemic continues to evolve. So we're beginning to face new challenges at this interface. So for example, we've learned um, that interspecies transmission can occur even when animals of different species are not directly interacting. We of course also continue to monitor the possibility of zoo animals um, transmitting infection to people, although we haven't um, detected this to date. And we of course know that rates of human vaccination, including booster vaccination and coverage continues to increase in the human population and that many zoos have opted to vaccinate susceptible species using the experimental Zoetis vaccine. And we're curious to see and understand more about how um, vaccination breakthroughs in people as well as vaccination breakthroughs in animals um, can affect transmission. And lastly, with the um, news of the Omicron variant, we are of course monitoring and concerned about how these different variants that continue to emerge will affect both the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 to zoo animals and other wildlife populations, as well as the disease severity. So these are some of the challenges that we are facing. And part of the reason that um, we are hosting this webinar today to speak with you all. Um, so while this, this doesn't sound like an encouraging situation, we do have some tools and resources that others um, from our panelists group will bring up next um, to try and help us combat this situation in, in zoos, sanctuaries, and aquaria. So that concludes what I'd like to speak about, and I will hand it back over to Dr. Sleeman. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Guy. Appreciate the, the presentation. Excellent information, as always. Um, for the sake of time, I think we'll move on to Dr. Karen Terrio, but, but, but Dr. Guy, there's a few questions that have come in to the Q&A. If you don't mind, if you get a chance to take a look at those and, and, and typing in responses you have, that would be great. Sure, thank you. So continuing on this, the same theme, uh, Dr. Karen Terrio is gonna, gonna give us um, her perspective on uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections in, in zoological set settings. So Karen, the floor is yours. Great, I'm assuming you can see my presentation. So, yes, we can, thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna provide um, some additional information and there'll be some, some information that's kind of similar to what Dr. Guy just presented, but with a slightly different um, emphasis. So as she has mentioned, um, the non-domestic infections, uh, animal infections in the United States um, are, are here on the, on the left. And what I've done is I've sort of ordered them with a timeline. So the spacing is actually has a lot to do with the timeline. And when, you know, when we first became aware of SARS-CoV-2, the initial concern had been apes. And so as she mentioned, it was surprising to all of us that the first diagnoses were in a tiger and then lions in New York. And with those first concerns, um, we both at the, the tag levels and individual zoos reached out to each other to discuss best practices and recommendations for mitigation. And as Dr. Guy noted, despite these rigorous mitigation strategies being in place, um, unfortunately, we've continued to have infections. Um, as you go down, I think that you can sort of you know see the, the situation we're in now um, has been, you know, and you, you saw that in her graphs as well, sort of increasing numbers of cases, but also increasing species diversity, which has been very concerning. And again, this sort of looks at those confirmed taxa worldwide that she's covered as well. I won't go into it in any other detail, other than to say that the, the carnivora seem to be very disproportionately affected um, in these other than obviously the humans um, within the hominidae. Um, but again, uh, you know, this is something that we have to remember that this is a human disease and it's spilling over, spilling back into our animals. Um, as she noted, the, the clinical signs, um, while the, the overall clinical signs in, in, in her graph were really driven by what we're seeing in felids, a lot of these clinical signs have been noted across a number of species. They've included things such as a dry cough, increased respiratory effort, 
I'd like to point out the ocular or nasal discharge. This has been seen in a number of cases, including some cases with profound epistaxis, such that the total blood, the, the PCV, the blood, um, the red blood cell levels have gone down in these animals and they become anemic. Some of the animals have been inappetent um, with lethargy, and then some have had GI signs, including diarrhea. There have also been some nonspecific clinical signs in animals. It's important to note, however, that some animals have also been asymptomatic. And what has been very clear is that we seem to be seeing more severe disease with Delta. And so whether some of our increased numbers are due to the fact that we're seeing more clinical disease and testing more, um, it's sort of hard to tell, but, but certainly there have been some more severe disease manifestations in Delta. And I'll just share here this video. Um, I, sure the people have seen some image videos of animals coughing, but this will be a video courtesy of Dr. Wright of the increased respiratory effort that's been seen in some of these cats. You can see that this leopard is open mouth breathing and has a lot of abdominal effort in order to breathe. Um, and so that's, these are some of the things that people, the clinicians have been seeing. Oops. Obviously, with any of these infections, the most important thing that we need to do is prevent them. Um, and that first, the first point here is key, is limiting transmission of the virus. We also, um, as a zoological community, have been incredibly um, fortunate and thankful to the Zoetis company for making the vaccine available for use in animals. Um, this was a recombinant vaccine that they developed for animal use specifically. Um, and they've donated more than 11,000 doses to the zoological community. But as noted, there have been breakthrough infections. And it's important to remember that this vaccine does not prevent infection, but it helps the animals in our care. It helps their immune system quickly recognize and hopefully clear the SARS-CoV-2 infection. But there have been breakthrough infections reported in both partial and fully vaccinated felids. I have not heard of similar breakthrough infections in apes or other species, but they may exist. And that said, the disease in these vaccinated animals has generally been mild. Um, and so, and to my knowledge, all the, these um, breakthrough infections, the animals have recovered as well. This next um, slide here shows a flowchart, an algorithm for determining the role of SARS-CoV-2 in, in disease and unfortunately in mortality in animals. Um, and so that's the, the next you know, step that we're at here to talk about. Um, and utilizing this flowchart, um, we're able to sort of characterize whether or not SARS-CoV-2 is important in the, the demise of individual animals. Um, and it includes information about whether or not the animals have, you know, certainly they have to be test positive for SARS-CoV-2, whether they have consistent clinical signs, whether they have comorbidities, it, whether or not the virus is actually present in the critical organs, and their histologic lesions that can be attributed to the viral infection. And that's what the, this flowchart helps us to understand whether or not the, the viral infection has been contributory to demise. And I'm going to note here, this is pre-publication inf information. Um, we're providing it here because we think it's important to get out to the zoological community, um, some of the things that are going on, but that this mortality investigation in these cases is still ongoing, and this has not been peer reviewed at this date. However, we have this preliminary, preliminary information that we can share. Um, it, I also want to emphasize that these outcomes are rare. Um, we're looking at less than 5% of the total um, infections and in felids that have had these outcomes, but that they can occur. To date, the cases that we have are in snow leopard, and that's multiple snow leopards, and a single lion. All of the individuals have been confirmed to have been infected with the Delta variant, and they've had an incredibly acute disease course. 
with the disease course being as little as three days from initial clinical sign to death. Um, in these cases, there was only very mild underlying disease in a couple of cats. One cat had epilepsy and um, another one had arthritis. At necropsy, neither of these lesions were of sufficient severity to have caused their death. The cats died or were euthanized because they were in severe respiratory distress. No other diseases were noted in the, these cats at the time of necropsy. We tested the lesions for the common feline pathogens and viral infections, including feline herpes virus and Khaleesi virus, and they have all been negative to date. In all of these cases, while there were bacteria and or fungal infections that may have precipitated the demise or contributed to the severity of their disease, these bacterial and fungal infections appear to be secondary infections, and they're secondary to the underlying damage that was already existing to the respiratory tract. And this damage had pathologic or histologic microscopic features that are consistent with a viral infection and were not consistent with a primary bacterial or fungal disease. In these cats, we have been able to confirm that both the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA, as well as protein consistent of an active viral infection, and these could be identified within the respiratory tract lesions. In some of these cats that had concurrent fungal infection, there was evidence of fungal sepsis um, that was contributed to death. These fungal infections, however, may have been predisposed to by antibiotic treatment that had been given early in the disease course, as the fungal co-infections occurred in the cats that died at the 14-day end of that range. And so those cats died between 12 and 14 days post-disease and treatment onset. Um, therefore, um, based on the information that we have to date and sort of using this, this algorithm, um, we feel that SARS-CoV-2 was considered either a contributing or a primary reason for the death of these cats. I'm going to show some histologic lesions so that you can sort of see what we're, we're talking about. But basically, um, what we're seeing in these cats are that they have a very severe and ulcerative um, and necrotizing rhinitis, so inflammation in the nasal passages that's associated with a copious exudate. So this is um, mucoid material within the nasal passages and in some cases hemorrhage, and that's sort of consistent with the clinical signs of epistaxis. The cats have had a very severe and ulcerative tracheitis, so inflammation and ulcers in their trachea, and they've had pneumonia. Um, it's predominantly a bronchopneumonia, but there is a component of interstitial edema and essentially flooding of the airways with both fluid and fibrin, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, as well as hemorrhage in some areas due to, and probably hemorrhage is likely due to the damage to the airways. The, based on these findings, we have a number of conclusions and recommendations that we can make. And the first is that prevention is key. Obviously, we don't want to, our cats to be in, um, infected. The most important thing that we can be doing is trying to prevent um, transmission of this virus to animals in our care. Um, and we're going to be spending the majority of this webinar talking about those types of uh, preventive measures that we can employ. Um, but we did want to provide this information of, on the mortalities so that you could understand the context for that. Testing is also considered to be important, especially testing early on. It'll give you information as far as whether the animals are infected or not, and then also can help guide um, treatment, as well as further preventive and mitigation strategies to prevent spread within animals in your collection. And of course, um, to guide your um, thinking as far as preventing your staff and in the humans that are working with the animals. Based on the lesions that we have seen, uh, the following is what we're going to be recommending with regards to treatment for animals. And the first one here, steroids, a lot of this has become, remember I mentioned that there was that flooding and filling of the, the airways with fluid. A lot of that is due to the immune response to the virus, but not the virus itself. 
And so we think that the, the use of steroids um, has a real role in the treatment of these cases. Because of the importance of secondary infections, antibiotics and antifungals are also strongly recommended. And many of the clinicians that we've talked to have also recommended the use and found that the animals responded well to appetite stimulants and supplemental oxygen. As far as testing is concerned, um, we've been through this in a number of different webinars and different forums, but remember that this is at the recommendation of your state animal health officials, and so you need to work closely with them, and they'll recommend which laboratory to send samples to for the initial testing, and those could be either the non or the National Animal Health Laboratory Network laboratories or private laboratories. And the cost of this initial testing is borne by the submitting institution, it's approximately $50. But then when those labs receive a positive test result, it's reported out as a presumptive positive, and there, the sample is then sent on to the National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa for confirmation automatically. And then the, the laboratory, the NVSL laboratory, will do that confirmatory testing. They use a, a reverse transcription PCR test for that. And in some cases, we'll perform whole genome sequencing, um, particularly in cases with high viral RNA levels or in unexpected mortalities. And then they will coordinate and work with the zoos to do the OIE reporting. And with that, um, I'd like to first uh, thank the, the number of the different zoological institutions that have provided information for us to better understand this disease and information and have been willing to share their cases with us, and in particular, Honolulu Zoo, the Lincoln Children's Zoo, and the Great Plains Zoo. And I'd like to thank um, my pathology colleagues, Dr. Jana Ritter at CDC and Mary Drozd at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for their assistance in working up these cases. And with that, I will hand it back to Jonathan. Thanks, Dr. Terrio. Very much appreciate uh, your presentation, the information you provided. Um, again, there's a few questions to you in the, in, in the Q&A, if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments to take a look. Um, otherwise, we'll move straight on to doc, Dr. Kate Varela, who's going to give us a presentation on a, a checklist tool that she's developed regarding preventive measures. Dr. Varela, are you able to show your slides? Uh, we can't hear you for some reason. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? We can. Thanks. Great. Well, sure. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me on the call today. I'm Kate Varela, a veterinary epidemiologist and preventive medicine fellow with CDC's One Health Office. And I'll be speaking with you today about some of the interventions that we've been working on, including a new biosecurity tool to help prevent SARS-CoV-2 infections in captive wildlife. So with the zoo investigation still ongoing, and given that there are still many unknowns about the source of exposure, and about species susceptibility to the virus and the severity of illness in these species, we've been asking ourselves, how do we work together using a One Health approach to best protect human health and animal health? How do we ensure that we're preventing spillback of the virus from infected zoo animals to visitors, to staff, and to volunteers? And how do we prevent zoo animals from getting infected in the first place? So we know that you all have long been taking precautions to prevent COVID-19. And here you can see an example from the Detroit Zoo's website, which provides potential visitors information on COVID-19 prevention when they're making a reservation for their visit. And these COVID-19 mitigation strategies, you know, they vary by facility and the location, depending on the local COVID-19 ordinances. In addition to the efforts to keep visitors safe, we know that you all are working hard to protect caretakers and animals too. As seen here with the caretaker wearing a face mask, even while working with a lion in an outdoor enclosure. But personal protective equipment protocols and other mitigation policies also vary by facility and may be influenced by local regulations. And some zoos, as was mentioned, have also begun vaccinating animals with the animal specific Zoetis vaccine. But again, vaccination plans vary by facility and availability of the vaccine. So as others have already mentioned, several efforts are underway to intervene to stop these cases and outbreaks. Public health, animal health, captive wildlife facilities, 
including possibly many of you on the call today, and professional organizations are collaborating on outbreak investigations, identifying risk factors and effective interventions and best practices. And we also developed the COVID-19 infection prevention and control assessment tool for captive wildlife facilities, which I'll be talking about in a bit more detail. So this tool provides a guide for baseline biosecurity measures and controls that should be in place to prevent transmission of SARS-CoV-2 between animals and people in settings with captive wildlife, such as zoos, sanctuaries, aquarium, and wild animal rehabilitation centers. It was developed based on other infection control assessment tools that aim to prevent the spread of infection and specifically COVID-19 in places where people live or spend time in close proximity, which are otherwise known as congregate settings. And it's been informed by investigation findings, um, existing guidance, and biosecurity principles. And it was developed using a One Health approach with input from public health, wildlife health, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership, and representatives from the zoos themselves. Um, there's a link to the tool at the bottom of this slide, but I'll also show you that a bit later and can put it in the chat box for everyone. So this tool is meant to be used by the administrators in charge of infection prevention and control at the facility, which may include occupational health, human resources, veterinary staff, or facilities and maintenance. And since COVID-19 mitigation protocols vary by facility and geographic region, we wanted to provide a resource to help identify gaps in control measures um, and how to address those gaps with feasible improvement activities with the goal of helping facilities develop a layered approach using multiple strategies to reduce the spread of disease between people, whether they're working at the facility or visiting and animals that are housed at these facilities. So the tool is organized around the principles of hierarchy of controls, and this is a way to think about interventions to control exposure to a hazard. In this case, the hazard is SARS-CoV-2. And if you're looking at the inverted pyramid on the right side of the screen, um, control measures at the top are, are more effective than those at the bottom. So eliminating or substituting the hazard are ideal, though in the case of a captive wildlife setting, these may not be practical options. Engineering controls refer to controls that remove the hazardous condition or place a barrier between the person or animal and the hazard to prevent them from coming into contact with the hazard in the first place. Administrative controls actually change the way people work by changing policies. So for example, requiring vaccination for all employees is an example of an administrative control. And finally, at the bottom of the triangle is personal protective equipment which is still important, but it is considered the least effective because it relies on the user to wear the equipment appropriately. And there's still a chance that exposure to the hazard can occur even with proper use. The tool was also developed around principles of biosecurity. And biosecurity refers to management practices that prevent introduction of the virus to the facility, thereby reducing the risk of disease and contamination. So these management practices are critical to both animal and human health and worker safety. And some of the primary components of a comprehensive biosecurity plan are shown here, but we'll discuss them in more detail as we go through the tool. So the tool is comprised of a checklist with seven specific sections seen here. And it also includes a comprehensive list of, res of resources. And it's available as a fillable PDF and it might be used electronically or printed. Um, the sections can be used together, which is what we're recommending currently, um, but they may also be used independently if a facility has a specific area that they want to strengthen. So this is an example of how the checklist is formatted. You can see section one, general infection prevention and control. Um, and the user would read the series of yes or no questions for this section. And for most of the questions, the preferred answer is yes. But if it is no, then the answer is specified. And the column on the right includes suggestions and resources to improve the specific biosecurity area to help guide improvement activities for any identified gaps. So for example, for question one here, which is, are COVID-19 symptom and temperature screening systems in place? If the answer is yes, then great, you can move on to the next question. But if the answer is no, the user can look at the column on the right where we've included suggestions to improve this biosecurity area by implementing a screening system, and we've provided some examples. Section one also includes questions on general facility management, including 
Is there a capacity limit? So it's recommended to implement some kind of reservation system to reduce crowding around animal exhibits and to improve social, social distancing between people and between people and animals. Another question is, are there policies to prohibit visitors from feeding the animals? Prohibiting animal feeding is important for many reasons, and including that we don't know if this could play a role in SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Um, signage indicating this behavior is prohibited around the facility may help discourage visitors by, from engaging in, in it. Additionally, signage describing COVID-19 mitigation measures in which animals are at risk or potentially at risk of infection is recommended to help visitors understand why it is important that they follow the COVID-19 precautions. And facilities can also consider making face masks available for those who don't have them to help improve, improve compliance with mask use. Section one also includes questions on susceptible species management, including whether the facility has identified susceptible animals, identified which caretakers are working with those animals, and if the number of caretakers working with those animals is being kept to a minimum. A log is recommended to keep track of who is interacting with known or confirmed susceptible species for contact tracing purposes in case a person or animal tests positive for SARS-CoV-2. And additionally, the checklist asks if caretakers are working with animals in the proper sequence. So going from first caring for susceptible animals that are healthy and last caring for animals with clinical signs that are compatible with SARS-CoV-2 to minimize potential cross-contamination. And this section also includes questions about engineering controls, such as physical barriers and ventilation system checks. So physical barriers are important to keep visitors from coming into close contact with animals and to prevent the virus from spreading between people and animals. The risk of spreading SARS-CoV-2 through ventilation systems is not clear, um, but facilities may consider consulting with an experienced HVAC professional to conduct a ventilation system assessment to ensure that ventilation systems operate properly and provide acceptable indoor air quality for each enclosure area and between enclosure areas and workspaces. And you can see CDC's ventilation and buildings webpage for tools to improve ventilation, which includes some no cost and low cost examples of ventilation interventions to improve air quality. The next question asks if there's an isolation area to keep animals with respiratory or GI signs isolated which is recommended if it's feasible. And then if feces are removed regularly from animal enclosures, um, we know SARS-CoV-2 may be shed in feces, thus it's important to ensure that they're removed from the animal area daily or more often if needed. Section two focuses on hand hygiene questions such as access to hand washing stations or hand sanitizer, and if there's appropriate signage to direct people to those stations. Ensure hand washing stations are easily accessible for employees and visitors in all areas of the facility, and especially where people may be in contact with animals, um, the animal enclosure and animal feed, or animals where people are eating and drinking. And if hand washing stations are not easily accessible, ensure hand sanitizer containing at least 60% alcohol is available. And signage with hand washing reminders is also recommended. Section three of the checklist focuses on environmental cleaning and ask the person to list the products that are used for cleaning and disinfection in the veterinary and animal housing areas of the facility to ensure that they're EPA approved for COVID-19 and that they're being used according to the label directions. Section four, vaccination and testing, asks about the policies for human and animal vaccination and testing protocols. And facilities may require, may consider requiring a proof of negative test result and or proof of COVID vaccination for those visitors participating in activities where they might have close contact with animals, such as behind the scenes experiences. Having a testing protocol in place is recommended to be prepared if an animal develops clinical signs consistent with SARS-CoV-2. In the case that an animal does develop these signs, best practice recommendations are to test for SARS-CoV-2 at the same time as other routine illnesses, and ideally to ensure testing occurs before multiple animals begin showing clinical signs consistent with SARS-CoV-2. Section five focuses on staff and visitor education and asks if employees receive training on which animals are um, susceptible and the disease prevention practices in place. It also asks whether visitors receive similar information. And by providing this information to staff and to visitors, we hope to improve compliance with mask use and keeping a distance from the animals 
and other COVID-19 mitigation protocols. Section six focuses on personal protective equipment. Um, and if there's a respiratory protection program in place at the facility for employees and volunteers. Respiratory protection, as we know, is especially important to prevent virus transmission. And well-fitting face masks covering the nose and mouth should be worn at all times when working indoors with susceptible animals, when training, when preparing diets and enrichment items, and when working outdoors within six feet of felids, regardless of the human vaccination status. Multiple ply surgical masks are preferred over other cloth face masks, and facilities may consider upgrading to fit tested N95s for those employees working with or around susceptible animals. All employees and volunteers should receive information at the training, at the um, information and training at the start of using PPE and annual refresher training as part of a, re a respiratory protection program. And the training should include information on putting on and taking off PPE making sure it fits correctly, how to dispose and store it, and for which activities it should be used. And for visitors, ideally face masks should be used during the entirety of the visit since there are many unknowns about species susceptibility and transmission of SARS-CoV-2 between people and animals. And ideally, this would be a well-fitting surgical mask. At minimum, visitors should wear face masks when visiting indoor exhibits housing susceptible animals and when participating in activities that may result in close contact with susceptible animals, such as animal encounters or behind the scenes tours. Section seven has a few additional questions on other public health control measures, such as if the facility has a process for reporting suspected animal cases, and if there's a, flex a flexible sick leave policy to help ensure that those who are ill, suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19 or who may have been exposed stay home to prevent infecting other people and animals. So that's the end of the checklist portion of the tool. The tool includes resources for more information on all the sections that are included in the checklist. There's a list of federal resource web pages that you can see here, and a list of professional organization resources that are shown here. So what's next? Um, now we're working to distribute this tool widely. And again, it's shown at the link on the slide. Um, please feel free to share it with your networks. And if you do use it at your facility, we're definitely interested in any feedback you have, including the usability, the feasibility of the recommendations. Did using the checklist uncover gaps that you could address or help inform protocols? Um, any other areas that you would have liked to see covered or any additional comments that you have? So please feel free to reach out to me and my colleagues. Um, at onehealth at cdc.gov if you have questions or to share feedback on the tool. Um, we'll also continue to collaborate on outbreak investigations, studies to identify risk factors, and continue to provide technical expertise as needed. So this has truly been a team effort of which I play a very small role. So I'd like to sincerely thank all involved, including all the zoo staff um, that aren't listed here by name, but have, who have been cooperating during the EPI investigations and doing all the boots on the ground work of implementing mitigation strategies, in addition to all the day-to-day -day animal care and other responsibilities. So just wanted to say that we so appreciate your hard work and want you to know that we're here to support you. So I'm happy to take questions at the end and we'll take a look at the chat box in case there are any. And thank you very much. With yeah, that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varela. Excellent presentation. Um, yeah, so 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 we keep moving on. If you can maybe just check the Q and A um, section, and feel free to answer any questions as we go along. Otherwise, we'll we'll pick them up at the at the end. Uh, and please do not minimize your role in in development of that checklist. You've done a fantastic job and uh, really re really hard work in putting that tool together. Okay, I think we're back now to Dr. Karen Terrio. She's going to give a brief presentation on 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 some of the current recommendations the different tax on advisory groups have, have issued. So uh, back to you, Karen, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And so we're, I'm gonna go through some of the different recommendations that have come out from the different tax on advisory groups, as well as SSPs. Um, and as you have just, you know, sort of heard a number of the, the, the with that checklist, a lot of these are gonna sound very familiar. Um, so first off, for those who may not be familiar, although I think most people on this call are, um, the Association of Zoos and Aquarium have a number of different tax on advisory groups. 
which develop recommendations for population management and conservation of those taxa. And within those taxon advisor groups there are often also species survival plans or SSPs. I'm going to um, highlight two of the, the recommendations from two of the taxon advisory groups. Um, first, I'll talk about um, APE TAG, taxon advisory group, and the veterinary advisor for that is Dr. Haley Murphy. Um, and then also the FELA taxon advisory group, um, of whom the advisors are Dr. Ellen Bronson, myself, and Dr. Denise McAloose. Um, as I mentioned previously, the APE TAG was the first one to sort of come out with the recommendations. We modeled the FELA TAG recommendations after the first cases were identified. We modeled our recommendations off of the APE TAG, and many of the other taxa and TAGs have modeled their recommendations off of those that we've put out. And then both the FELID and APE TAG recommendations have been updated recently as new information has come out. Um, there are also these recommendations, if you want to actually find them, oops, sorry, can be found on um, the ZAP website as well as on the ZooVet um, website. So both these are available on both of those um, as far as resources. And many of these recommendations um, are really involved in sort of breaking this cycle with transmission. Um, so as we know, obviously the animals in our care are getting the infection from us. Um, and then there has certainly been concern about um, animal to animal spread. Um, and we don't yet know about the potential for um, in, infections to go from animals in our care back to us. I think we always have to remember that the reality is that this is a human disease pandemic and that any animals are anim any humans our animals are exposed to, we are too. And so the chance of us getting infected from other humans is much, much greater. And that's really where um, the emphasis needs to be placed. And so our goal is to break this transmission cycle at the very beginning. With regards to the APE Taxon Advisory Group, um, their recommendations um, in, are um, sort of hitting multiple of those areas in the hierarchy of control. Obviously, we're looking at things like PPE and disinfection of different, um, both the PPE for humans, obviously, and disinfection of any commonly touched, those common touch points, so food, um, bowls, and whatnot. Um, making sure that when people are preparing diets, and I know that I saw there was a number of questions coming through on this, and we'll, we'll discuss those in the live Q&A, um, but making sure that people are wearing masks during prep, food preparation and gloves as well. Um, limiting access, trying to really identify who needs and, and, and to have access to the animals and how close they need to be in proximity. Um, I think many of the different taxa um, recognize the importance of training with for our animals, and we don't want to limit that because of there's enormous benefits um, for the animals, both from a welfare standpoint, but also should they actually get sick, there have been benefits to having animals that are trained to be able to get good diagnostic samples as well as provide treatments to them. The APE tag recommendations also include staff screening, so symptomatic screening of staff but then also recommending and looking at potential for staff bottlenecks. So if you have to go to a situation where you limit your staffing, how does that work in, as far as making sure that we're managing our apes in a way that is benefiting their welfare, but is also um, maximizing the safety to our human personnel? Um, with the FELA tag recommendations, we have also recommended every institution do a risk assessment um, and so looking at both their, their different protocols that they have in place, taking into account things like the community transmission rates at present, as well as human infection risks. Um, for the cats, um, we have recommended now, and based off of the, the more recent information that we have, that regardless of staff vaccination status, that they should be wearing well-fitting masks and that these should be NIOSH approved surgical masks um, as, as opposed to cloth masks. Um, as um, Kate mentioned, looking into building ventilation and are there ways to improve bu building um, ventilation and disinfection of surfaces and the use of gloves. Many um, institutions have also looked at the need to utilize high pressure hoses or not, especially when you have, if you are in the middle of an outbreak at the time. 
And so limiting um, anything that could potentially be aerosolizing virus that's shed from infected animals. As far as staff recommendations, so again, symptom screening, limiting access, and making sure to maintain that log of who is interacting with the animals um, and who is in proximity to the animals. Um, and that will certainly help out when, we're when we have to go back and do an epidemiologic investigation. We've also recommended that people do sort of a proximity assessment. Where are those pinch points? Where are there places where either staff or even potentially the public are within closer proximity to the animals and could serve as a source for infection to the animals? And then, of course, finally, vaccination. And so obviously we're recommending both vaccination of staff and felids in your care. The Snow Leopard SSP has also issued some additional recommendations on top of those of the Felid Taxon Advisory Group, which recommends vaccination of all snow leopards themselves. So again, this would be utilizing the Zoetis vaccine. Having only fully vaccinated staff working with snow leopards, limiting staff overlap with other species, the use of PPE, including gloves and NASH surgical or potentially even the use of N95 masks when working around snow leopards. And then, as I mentioned previously, testing at the first signs of infection in these cats. And they've also re um, requested that people rapidly share information about any cases that they might be having. And I've listed the email here. This is the, a Google group email. An email to this group will send it out to the, the Snow Leopard SSP health advisors. And so, and again, if you want that, that information is here, sorry, um, again, as resources um, for you. And these were the resources that I used for this presentation and where you can find those. Great. Thank you, Dr. Terrio. And, and we recognize that we've been giving a lot of links to different resources. I believe that we will be sharing all this information um, to you af afterwards so you can have easy access to all the resources. Um, and again, Dr. Terrio, if there's any questions in the Q&A that come up, feel free to, to address them or, or we can wait until we get to the live session. All right, so we're gonna transition now to uh, different case reports. And first up is Dr. Lauren Howard is gonna get, uh, talk about some cases at, at San Diego. Uh -huh. Can you uh, go ahead and share share your slides? Excellent. All good. Can you see it? All good. Thank All you. All right. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for your time today. I'm going to take about ten minutes to share you uh, share an update with what's been going on in our neck of the woods. The San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance is a conservation organization with two front doors: the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. The information I'll be sharing today is a compilation of data from our SARS-CoV-2 cases at both campuses. And I'd like to thank my San Diego Zoo counterpart, Dr. Meg Sutherland-Smith, for partnering with me on this presentation. This chart is the meat and potatoes of our last year here in our little corner of Southern California. Safari Park cases are in orange and San Diego Zoo cases are in green. I'll go into a bit more detail on the park gorilla and park tiger cases in the next couple of slides. Starting with our gorillas in early January of 2021, we have documented five separate instances of our zoo animals becoming ill from SARS-CoV-2 with positive PCRs on fecal samples and in some cases on respiratory samples as well. In four of these five cases, some degree of medical intervention for the animals was needed. And in two cases, anesthesia for treatment and diagnostics was required. To date, all of our animals have recovered clinically with no residual concerns that can be detected. Our first experience with COVID was a doozy. Our family troop of eight gorillas were clinically impacted over a three week period in early January. The PPE in place at the time of diagnosis included daily temperature checks of all staff, daily med medical questionnaires of all staff, dedicated uniforms and shoes, and surgical grade face masks when in the gorilla building or near the gorillas. This event occurred before vaccines were available to our staff, so none of our staff were vaccinated. We do have sequencing confirmation that a staff member and the gorillas shared an identical isolate. The park was closed to the public at that time, so it was easier to narrow down the source of infection. 
And this staff member was following all protocols and was asymptomatic at the time of transit transmission. This is an overview of the clinical observations and timeline of our gorilla troop. Our two oldest animals on the bottom of the chart were the only ones with moderate to severe signs requiring intervention. The others in the troop had mild signs, handled the virus well on their own, and the virus ran its course through the whole troop in about three weeks. We extended our period of heightened PPE for a total of 6.5 weeks, at the time reasoning that a three-week window after the last gorilla started to show clinical signs was a reasonable buffer, um, and we were just kind of making things up at that point. This, uh, we used a daily observation sheet to keep track of the COVID-related clinical signs in our eight gorillas. This was developed off the CDC epidemiology questionnaire for outbreaks, and it enabled us to collect data that was as objective as possible. We've gone back to this data time and time again as other institutions that caring for apes have approached us with questions, and I'm happy to share it with anyone who's interested. Now, our 49-year-old silverback showed progressive lethargy and complete apathy towards his family troop in addition to coughing and shortness of breath. So we did elect to perform an anesthetized diagnostic exam on day seven of his clinical signs. He was anesthetized with telozole given through IM through voluntary injection. And once recumbent, we brought him to our hospital on Safari Park grounds. His anesthesia was super challenging due to swelling in the pharyngeal area, copious fluid in his respiratory tract and constant coughing, which required frequent suctioning of the endotracheal tube. An echocardiogram did show left ventricular dysfunction and ventricular bigeminy, um, giving us an empirical di diagnosis of viral myocarditis, which is a common sequelae to COVID in some humans. We were relieved to find that he did fit into our CT gantry and CT imaging revealed a right-sided pneumonia and some pleural effusion, also not surprising considering his clinical picture. He received multiple treatments during his exam, and after his procedure, we started him on oral dexamethasone and oral azithromycin, which is a theme you'll see throughout our cases. We also started a cardiac regimen, including amiodarone and carvedilol, and we worked very closely with the Great Egg Park Project on his treatment plan. We did administer monoclonal antibodies to Winston, our silverback. We gave him two human doses combined in one liter of fluids and administer IV over an hour. These were from a research supply and not from the current human supply. That was very important to us. We did get FDA emergency use approval and the monoclonals arrived within an hour of the start of Winston's exam on our loading dock. He recovered slowly but eventfully from uneventfully from anesthesia and we began to see clinical improvement within 48 hours of the exam and he's now doing well. So some lessons from our gorillas. One thing our public health partners emphasized throughout our, all of our COVID cases was the importance of ventilation and increasing airflow in the buildings whenever possible. This is something to seriously consider when designing or updating holding spaces and when performing the risk assessments as we just went over of our animals. Um, we did put together a two-page white paper, um, which many of you may have seen after our gorilla episodes, and it is available on the ZAP website. Um, the link is here, and we'll put it in the materials afterwards. It does have a complete detailed breakdown of our PPE during that event. Um, the instant and sustained interest it, our public health colleagues had in our gorilla situation was impressive. They saw their job as ensuring that whatever virus was in our gorillas was not going to get back to the community. As Delta and now Omicron has shown us, this virus is able to mutate into new variants. And when any virus moves between species, there's always a potential for a new mutation or another variant to develop. So our public health colleagues work very closely with us to help make sure our staff and communities stay safe as we're also caring for our animals. So while SARS-CoV-2 testing of our animals may not change the specific care, of the majority of the animals who are infected, it's critically important to know what animals are shedding the virus so we can protect our staff who care for them every day, as well as other animals near them. So then we get into July and we had just started vaccinating our tigers and we came to an abrupt halt when three of our tigers became, began coughing in a two day period. In our tiger cases, we had given three of our tigers the very first Zoetis vaccine and the coughing developed shortly after. We don't think that's related. I think it's just coincidence. And in the textbook definition of poor timing, we had just transferred two new tigers from quarantine into our tiger building the day before coughing developed. Um, we are very confident that the tigers moving into quarantine were um, asymptomatic and subclinical. So we think the infection started in the tiger building. And you'll see these tigers are at the bottom of this chart. 
they became SARS-CoV-2 positive in their feces very quickly after going into the building, even though they were on the other side of the large, well-ventilated building and never had nose-to-nose contact with the other tigers. Our older male tiger who already had renal insufficiency became inappetent and lethargic. We grew concerned about hydration, dehydration. Um, he responded really well to dexamethasone treatment and a course of oral dexamethasone and azithromycin, so no further intervention was needed. And while the clinical signs in our tigers lasted about two weeks, we maintained heightened PPE, including closure of the habitat to guests for about seven weeks total due to continued positive fecal PCR results for several weeks following clinical signs. One thing that helped us a lot was remote viewing of our tigers in the building, particularly that older tiger we were concerned about. It allowed the vets and the curators to see the animal together at the same time without having to go into that infested building. Um, and it was a real key to helping us to determine how to manage his case. Um, and our staff caring for these tigers were fully vaccinated and it, it did not prevent this COVID episode and our tigers from happening. So while vaccination of staff is an important measure in protecting our animals for sure, it is not bulletproof. Um, and this was our first experience at SDZWA with Delta in animals and the speed with which it spread through our tigers, especially this large building and all of these outdoor single habitats, it was very impressive um, and it is not something to be taken lightly. So moving on to vaccinations at San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, we identified animals for vaccination based on three factors, susceptibility, perceived susceptibility based on actual reports of infections, um, evaluation of those ACE2 receptors, you've seen the papers, and then risk of exposure based on where those animals are housed. And that's exposure to people, including staff and guests. We did vaccinate all of our apes, most old world primates, all lemurs, all felids, and a subset of other carnivores, a total of 240 animals between the zoo and the safari park. And we did prioritize animals that were in indoor buildings, which with San Diego, it's not too many with our beautiful weather. And there was a question about collecting pre-vaccine um, serum titers. We did collect and bank pre-vaccine blood samples on many of our animals that were trained to allow voluntary blood collection. That was not to determine if they were suitable for vaccine. It was purely for epidemiologic purposes and not all of those have been run yet. So our take home on the Zoetis vaccine and our animals is it, it does appear to be safe with minimal side effects. Early post-vaccine titers on a smattering of animals are very variable and it's, it's really too early to determine what level of titers is protective. I think that's gonna take a little bit more time to suss out. And it's just most important to remember that vaccination doesn't mean you can discontinue other biosecurity preventives. It's one important tool of our toolbox, but it certainly isn't the only one as, as my colleagues on this um, Zoom call have, have told us today. And a brief look at cervids, they've been under a lot of discussion lately because of the white-tailed deer work. Uh, we are just beginning to assess the risk to the 11 species and 100 cervids that call the Safari Park home. And we'll be sure to share how things shape up on that front as we get a little further along. So just a few final lessons learned. Um, 2021 was certainly a growth opportunity for us as far as COVID goes here in San Diego. Um, we recognize probably above all that decisions about PPE and other protocols protecting our animals should always be written in pencil for sure. Here, veterinary and animal care leaders meet regularly to go over the last information that's available and update or tweak our protocols. We go back and forth a lot. Um, everyone recognizes that things can change. When an animal is clinically ill and positive for SARS-CoV-2, the PPE is pretty obvious. You use it all. And that's actually the easy part. The part that is challenging and it requires a lot of collaboration is deciding when it's safe to step back down the enhanced PPE. And even harder than that, it's to determine if any new protections are needed to be implemented to prevent that infection in that animal from occurring again. Um, and that's where I think we're all struggling and sharing information like this can help. I also wanna stress the importance of testing suspect animals. While many zoo animals will survive infection without intervention, if they are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and not diagnosed, they can be a source of infection to other animals and to the staff caring for them. And it is our responsibility to do what we can to keep everyone safe. I'm gonna mention it one more time, ventilation is key. It's an important part of risk assessment and in providing animals with a safe environment. And finally, the mink coronavirus vaccine is a tremendous tool. It's donated to our community by Zoetis. 
it will likely take at least another year or more before we can really fully understand its impact and efficacy on animals exposed to SARS-CoV-2. For those of you who have the vaccine, thank you for sharing your experiences. And for those of you who haven't gotten it yet, hopefully it will be commercially available soon and, and you can take this journey with us together. As zoo professionals dedicated to the care and conservation of our wild species, we have done our best to rise to the challenge that COVID-19 has placed before us. Partnering with public health and human health specialists, as well as experts throughout the zoo community, we've learned so much and the animals under our care have benefited and continue to thrive. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to share our information and I'll, I'll be happy to take questions when it's time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Yeah, again, if you want to just check check the Q&A box in case anything has come, come in, otherwise we will definitely um, leave some time for live questions. Um, so thank you. Um, moving along, uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Sathya Chinajorai, who's going to give a presentation on his experiences at the San Diego Zoo. Uh, Sathya, are you, are you there? Oh, I'm there here. You are. Yep. Excellent. All right, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, we'll be talking a little bit um, just on a, on a relatively limited, uh, relatively limited outbreak of cases um, at the St. Louis Zoo that we've experienced over the past uh, few months here. Uh, thankfully, our cases here are limited um, to animals in, in one building in all field. So we'll be, be a limited discussion here. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on our staff safety practices as well, some repetition of things that you've heard um, from some of the other speakers. I will mention that this is a very limited description of the very extensive staff safety practices that we've had in place now for, for almost two years. Um, we have a, um, a very talented Department of Safety and Risk Management, as well as an in-house um, epidemiologist and Dr. Deem, who've been able to work with um, veterinary staff, animal management, and zoo management to to have a very extensive staff safety um, protocol to limit um, disease transmission from human to human um, within our zoo staff. We'll touch some on uh, the vaccination plan that we had in place um, at the time of our outbreak uh, using the Zoetics vaccine, and then talk through some of our cases um, that we saw in our large field collection here at the St. Louis Zoo, including the, the clinical signs, how we diagnose those cases, the treatment of the symptomatic cases and then the ongoing monitoring that we have uh, in our animals. So as I mentioned, um, this is just the highlights of some of the safety precautions that we had in place. Um, many of these were in place prior to the first reported cases in zoo animals, but especially um, after the tiger cases reported in April um, of 2020, uh, we did to reinforce a lot of these protocols. Uh, including masks for all staff working indoors and those working with high risk species. Uh, we did include gloves for all animal related tasks, um, cleaning and food prep. And uh, as much as possible, try to maintain six foot distance um, from, from all susceptible species, but especially from cats um, in this scenario. There were certain situations when we deemed a closer contact to be medically necessary. So some of those may have been medically needed training exercises or shifting. Um, including uh, training for, for vaccination. In cases uh, where we did have close contact, staff were, fit tested staff were wearing N95s um, for close contact. And during medical procedures, um, anyone in close contact with the animal uh, was wearing an N95. Anyone working in the oral cavity or performing intubation um, also was wearing a face shield um, during that close contact. Um, during the beginning of this time period, we did have coveralls and dedicated clothing and footwear per building to limit um, transmission, potential transmission between buildings. And then we did identify some areas where, um, where there was, it was possible for, a, for the guests to, become, to get within six feet of our um, cat enclosures, cat habitats. And we did add supplemental barriers to those, to those areas to augment those, um, those distancing. In April of 2021, um, at that time, all carnivore staff, all veterinary staff, um, and the vast majority of all animal care staff had been vo had voluntarily um, been vaccinated. Uh, and then in August of 2021, just as a point of reference, we did require um, for this 
for all zoo staff to be vaccinated. So that's that's a um, procedure that's ongoing now where we're, we're getting all zoo staff vaccinated. So the cases we'll touch on today, um, all were localized to one, um, one area of the zoo, which we uh, refer to as Big Cat Country. Uh, thankfully for, for us, um, Big Cat Country is all open air exhibits, um, all the habitats are outdoors where there's no indoor public viewing. Um, separation of the animals from the public um, established with moats, mesh barriers, and, and rail barriers. Um, the downside is there is a shared indoor holding space for all cats. And as, as Dr. Howard and others mentioned, um, that does prevent present a lot of challenges um, for uh, limiting um, spread between animals, especially um, with older ventilation systems. So you can see in some of those areas, we did find um, points where uh, a guest could become, be within six feet of an animal during one of its resting perches. Um, so here, this is a still leopard habitat where an animal could easily come up to the mesh and be within four feet of a, of a guest. So the supplemental barriers were added there to, to increase that distancing. In the building, in big cat country, we have a variety of larger um, cat species, uh, Amur tigers, le uh, African lions, Amur leopards, one cougar, uh, snow leopards, jaguar, and a single serval. Um, I highlighted this handsome gentleman, gents, handsome gentleman here. Um, this is a male um, Amur leopard in our collection. This was actually the only animal that um, came to uh, came to the St. Louis Zoo partially vaccinated. He was actually vaccinated at a previous institution before being shipped to the zoo. So he was our, our first vaccine candidate. Uh, in addition to those animals in big cat country, we're also managing one female tiger in quarantine at the hospital, as well as a number of cheetah, hyena, and small carnivores that were in other buildings, but with some crossover of staff. And starting in September of uh, of this year, we did begin vaccination with the Zoetis SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, starting with uh, the high priority species. So we um, identified all of our primates, um, felids, canids, um, our small carnivores, and a hyena um, as, our, as our targets for vaccination. We were able to roll out that vac the vaccination pretty um, quickly and efficiently. Thankfully, uh, most of our animals were trained uh, for hand injection and staff were able to begin vaccinating felids. And within, um, within the first week of October, uh, almost all of the felids in our collection had received uh, their first dose of that vaccine. And by the end of October, um, between the 22nd and the 26th of this year, most of those cats were able to receive um, their second or booster dose. We did separate out uh, the lions. The lions were vaccinated on a later date because those, those animals were vaccinated by remote injection instead of hand injection. So we wanted to, to, to space out that, um, those events. And things were going great um, up until about this point. We were able to roll out the vaccine. We did some, some PR to talk about our preventative health protocols and how we were um, uh, instituting comprehensive preventative health, um, especially in the face of this, this pandemic. And then shortly after our animals received their booster dose, we had one male lion uh, present with signs of mild lethargy. And at the time, he was simply lethargic, less willing to shift. Uh, and we, uh, that day, attributed some of this to uh, a response to his second um, booster dose, as we had seen a few animals in our collection show mild signs of lethargy with no respiratory signs after their second dose of a vaccine. But then the following day, um, he did develop mild ocular and nasal discharge and a cough. And on that same day, a female snow leopard also developed signs of nasal discharge. The female snow leopard had an on and off multi-year history of, of intermittent nasal discharge and upper respiratory infections. Um, so this was within, within the realm of her normal, but obviously um, simultaneous with this male lion developing clinical signs. So at that time, we began uh, screening of those animals uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Fecal samples were collected on the affected animals um, and submitted uh, to, to our university laboratory for fecal PCR after approval from the state veterinarian uh, for that submission. And then we began some advanced safety precautions and daily monitoring of all of our animals. 
some of those advanced um, precautions, our safety and risk management team began uh, contact tracing for any staff that entered the building 12 days prior to that first clinical case um, with, with symptoms and exposure risk questionnaires. Uh, no positive or symptomatic staff members were identified um, that had entered that building or been in close contact with those, those animals um, during that question period. We limited staff crossover between field areas. As I mentioned, all these cases were limited to one building uh, in our zoo, but we did have felids in other areas of the zoo and other carnivores. So we, we limited staff crossover between big cat country and areas housing cheetah, hyena, and other, other carnivores. Uh, we limited staff access to that building to the, to the um, minimum number of carnivore keepers that were needed to conduct the daily activities uh, in that building. And then in cases where a veterinary staff member had to enter the building, we wore uh, dedicated clothing for that, um, for that event. Uh, our staff was um, amazing in their ability to provide very in-depth monitoring, including video recordings. Um, so we limited the number of times that vet staff had to come into that building, potentially limiting spread throughout the zoo. Um, we did uh, move from, from surgical masks to N95s or KN95s for all activities within the building, uh, and then reinstituted foot baths and dedicated footwear. So that following week, um, we re received our first uh, positive fecal PCR results from the, the two animals that were showing clinical signs on that first day. Um, and here are my abbreviations, um, CT is cycle threshold. And we were considering a positive test based on, on the university and NVSL guidelines. A positive test was a cycle threshold of less than 40. Uh, so our male, our male lion did test positive. Our female snow leopard, uh, interestingly, was a presumptive or suspect positive um, as it was only positive at one of three targets on the fecal PCR. So in conversations with the state lab, um, this was an animal that potentially could have been called negative, but in the face of its clinical signs, we were calling it a, a suspect positive. We began symptomatic treatment for all the affected cats. Um, so animals that were showing signs of upper respiratory infection, um, with cough or nasal discharge, were put on antibiotics for secondary infections. And then we added in uh, meropotent uh, or mirtazapine for animals that had a decrease in appetite. Um, during this time, we did begin to see some additional affected cats within the building. Uh, a male cougar developed clinical signs uh, a few days after these first few cases, and then a male tiger with, male, with mild uh, upper respiratory signs a few days following the cougar. During this time, we were operating under the assumption that these were all positive cases based on the presumptive positive results uh, that we received from our university laboratory. But uh, final confirmation from NVSL on our initial samples did not come till um, actually almost two weeks later. Um, and that was also confirmed to be uh, the Delta variant of concern, as we mentioned in the previous cases. So as soon as we we received the first um, fecal positives on our symptomatic cases. We began extensive screening on all of the animals in the building, uh, and that included um, weekly fecal testing uh, of, of each of the cats, regardless of clinical signs. We also tested select animals in other buildings, so animals that potentially had mild signs of an upper respiratory infection or where we thought there was potentially a risk of, of some crossover or transmission um, uh, from big cat country. Again, that positive um, target was a cycle threshold of, of less than 40, which is indicated by this dotted uh, uh, black line on this graph. The, the graph here that I'm, I'm showing, I'll expand on in the next slide, uh, but these are the, the colored lines here are uh, representing the inverse of the cycle threshold um, on the y-axis and date on the, on the x-axis. And each individual line represents an individual animal in the in that building in our collection, and so as the lines go up, that is indicating a higher um, uh, degree of shedding, so the inverse of that cycle threshold. And pay attention to this red line um, at the top. That red line represents our male cougar. Um, he did have the highest reported cycle threshold during the screening period, uh, which is also interesting because he was the animal that had the worst clinical signs um, during this outbreak. 
What else is interesting uh, is we did have multiple asymptomatic positive cats. So both our male and female jaguars, the female lion that actually shared the enclosure with the male lion um, was predominantly asymptomatic. She had one day of a very mild cough, um, which um, resolved with no treatment. And the male snow leopard was also asymptomatic, but still shedding. We did have some animals in the building that were serially negative, um, both on our leopards and the serval um, tested negative um, on multiple um, sequential tests. So this is a graph just blown up a little bit bigger. That dotted black line is what we considered our positive threshold. Um, so we had a few animals that actually had um, been tested earlier on that had come back negative prior to this outbreak. But you can see um, around the 4th of November, that's when we started screening all of the animals in the building and all of those animals were above um, uh, the positive threshold uh, at that point, um, all of the animals listed here. In most cases, um, fecal shedding did trend along with clinical signs. So the animals that did have clinical signs um, as they started to resolve their clinical signs with treatment or uh, with time, fecal shedding did, did begin to decrease. This male cougar actually um, lagged behind uh, both in the development of clinical signs and in the spike in his um, fecal shedding. But that animal also was the one that, that demonstrated the worst clinical signs of our group. So that animal uh, had his first day of clinical signs on the 5th of November, and that presented with a raspy breathing and a characteristic uh, neck extended posture with his tongue out. And very similar to that snow leopard you saw in Dr. Terrio's talk, um, there was a very labored, um, very audible breathing noted, uh, a pronounced abdominal component, um, multiple days of, of coughing. And as soon as the respiratory signs started, we did begin uh, antibiotics to prevent secondary bacterial infections. And as soon as his appetite declined, we did start um, meropitant as an anti-nausea medication, which did not improve his appetite. So we, we switched to mirtazapine to act as an appetite stimulant. And even with antibiotic therapy um, over the first couple of days, his cough did worsen, and then he did become lethargic, um, unwilling to shift, really unwilling to get up off of um, uh, resting surfaces. We did add a second antibiotic, but also in, in consultation, in continuous consultation with colleagues at other institutions about um, additional therapies. Um, we, we opted to add in a steroid. So at this time, uh, we did have oral prednisone in stock, and we did start that animal on prednisone orally. Uh, in that first day, we did not see much improvement uh, with the steroid and also added in oral albuterol because um, the cough did progress to a cough coupled with a wheeze. Uh, and then a few days after starting the oral steroids and the oral albuterol um, as a bronchodilator, we did see marked clinical improvement and an improvement in his clinic and his appetite. And then uh, the following day, um, we're able to stop the appetite stimulant because the animal's um, food consumption had resumed. About 15 days um, after the start of clinical signs, we did see more normal breathing uh, and more regular normal breathing. And we were able to stop the antibiotics um, and albuterol. Uh, during this time, we were able to actually switch him from prednisone to prednisolone um, with the idea that that might be more bioavailable to a felid. Um, so at this time, he was on prednisolone. After 17 days of, from the clinical signs, um, we were able to, to start slowly weaning that prednisolone, keeping a close eye on any, re any recurrence of upper respiratory signs, coughing or wheezing. And then 25 days after the initial clinical signs started, uh, we were able to stop treatment. We consider this animal clinically normal based on behavior, appetite, and respiratory signs. But interestingly, this animal is still continuing to shed um, in his, in his uh, fecal samples. So what's some of the highlights um, from some of these, these cases that we, we saw here, we did have an unknown infection source. So we presumed that there was a human source um, for this infection, but we don't, have a source, we don't have a source identified. And then we're also presuming that there was some animal to animal transmission. So if an initial animal was infected by the humans, by a human source, that we were able to see animal to animal transmission throughout the building. 
some of these cases do qualify as breakthrough cases. All of those animals were um, at least partially vaccinated at the time of presumed exposure. Some of them were fully vaccinated at the time that they developed clinical signs, uh, including that one animal that came, came to the collection um, already partially vaccinated. So that animal had had um, at least four weeks after its booster dose um, before, before this outbreak started. But the good news was that we did see apparent vaccine efficacy and limiting severity. So talking to colleagues that had animals that were of the same species that were exposed um, without the benefit of vaccines, um, our cases were um, relatively mild. So most of our animals were able to resolve with, with uh, oral antibiotics alone, with the exception of this one cougar that required additional therapy. We did see multiple asymptomatic shedders, so highlighting the importance of fecal screening, uh, the jaguars, the male snow leopard, and the female lion. And we did see some animals that were negative despite exposure uh, and negative on serial testing. And interestingly, our most severe case in this group was a cougar. Um, There's one other report that we were able to find of a cougar that, that um, was clinically affected by SARS-CoV-2, um, but it's not a species that had been reported much um, uh, in, in discussions with other uh, other institutions. And then we're continuing to see persistent shedding after resolution of clinical signs. So interestingly, we've been seeing some, some pretty um, linear decline in fecal shedding, except some of our asymptomatic animals have been have been having uh, intermittent spikes in their fecal shedding. So our fecal our female lion actually is currently shedding at a relatively high level compared to where she was two weeks ago. And I think this highlights some of the importance that even with um, even with no clinical signs or resolution of clinical signs, continued monitoring to make sure that um, animals are actually clearing infection, and then some monitoring after um, resolution of fecal shedding is important to make sure that that shedding does not uh, uh, begin again after you know a presumed resolution of clinical disease. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, everyone that, that helped with these cases our colleagues at other AZA institutions um, for giving their insight on their clinical management of cases, um, the carnivore keepers who were able to provide daily, um, very detailed assessments of all of the animals and their care, uh, the veterinary staff that was able to, to provide this, this care, and especially the, the diagnostic labs that were very responsive um, to our needs and able to provide us with high quality rapid results. So I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Satya. Very good. Excellent presentation. So that concludes the, the presentation. So we're going to transition into the question and answer session. I'm going to pass this back to Dr. Sharon Deem, who's going to um, uh, read out the live, the questions we'd like to answer live and then call upon the panelists. But please do keep your questions coming in in the Q&A session. Uh, I'll be tracking those and, and, and passing those along to the uh, to share on the panelists to, to answer. We may not be able to get to all, all the questions, and so we may try and um, answer them some after the fact. So, so Dr. Deem, over to you to, to start with the Q&A session. Great, thanks. And uh, just a big thank you to the panelists. This was fantastic, uh, so informative, and also for the questions coming in. And I'm going to start us off with a question uh, for Dr. Ria Guy. So this one's coming at you. And it is, has it been demonstrated yet that the virus can be transmitted from people to animals via diet preparation, either through respiratory spread to the food or via contaminated hands while handling the food? Or is this still just a theoretical method of transmission? Dr. Dean, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so we've never discovered that contaminated food was a source of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and that's both in people and animals. Um, so we know that the risk of transmission is far greater from direct interaction between two susceptible hosts, whether they're two people or two animals or a person and an animal. Um, because really this virus doesn't survive well on surfaces or for very long. Um, but there's been a few investigations where there have been commissary stuff that have been considered as a potential source of exposure. And that's potentially because um, in a lot of these facilities that um, we have investigated, it seems like the staff work in isolation. And because of that, there might be more relaxed policies about masking. Um, so there's potential that they might have had um, direct exposure with 
um, diets without necessarily a mask in between. Um, and then in addition, there were some instances where diets were fed out pretty immediately um, after preparation. So I think in a situation like that, it would be theoretically possible that this might be a source of um, exposure. Um, but in a lot of instances, what we've also heard is that diets are um, prepared quite a ways in advance. And if that's the case and they're sitting for quite some time, it doesn't seem realistic or very likely that um, they would be a source of infection in that case because we know the virus survives very short periods of time um, outside of hosts. Um, and then just one additional thing to mention, um, there have been a few cases um, that some of which we've talked about that um, the source of exposure was pretty enigmatic. So um, situations where all of the staff and caretakers were tested, they were all negative, and then the animals are separated physically um, from the public by things like uh, plexiglass barriers, for example. And in those instances, um, there was investigation about the possibility that the public could have dropped something into a zoo animal's enclosure that the animal might have been interested in. Um, I think we can all think about like hot dogs and hamburgers being things that an animal might have interacted with. Um, but really transmission through these routes um, has never been shown and it's theoretically possible um, if more likely routes of transmission have been rolled out in investigations. Great, thank you. So um, the next question, I'm gonna introduce Dr. John Hardham has uh, joined us in the panel, which thank you so much from Zoetis. And we're, we're very pleased you have joined in for the Q&A period. Um, this question I'm gonna to direct towards you and Dr. Howard. You can tag team and if you wanna say anything additionally about the, the vaccine. But the question is, should we be testing animals for COVID antibodies before vaccinating them? Oh, thank you. It's uh, very much my pleasure to, to join this esteemed group. Uh, and it's also our, our pleasure to help assist the Zoo Veterinarian Committee to our commission and group to help protect your animals. Um, as far as pre-testing for antibodies, you know, similar to the human situation uh, where after an initial infection, they do recommend a waiting period before initiating vaccination to help booster the titers, uh, just because some very low level initial infections, say with the Wuhan 1 variant, uh, may not generate a sufficient immune response to protect against later infection with variant viruses. Uh, so we don't necessarily require a pre-screen of animals uh, prior to vaccination, just if they had been previously infected to allow a sufficient time period, uh, approximately 60 days or so uh, after resolution before vaccination. Dr. Howard, you're good with that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. Um, we'll move on to the next question, which this one is gonna go to our CDC colleagues. So both of you um, may wanna, um, answer this one. And, and there are two questions I'll ask at the same time. And, and one is, when facilities are using N95s, are they fit testing all staff or just deploying the mask? And what are current thoughts on the use of face shields in addition to mask? Is this useful or not? I can okay. use if you'd like. <laughs> So for the face shield question, I think in the past, we've, what we've been recommending, especially when there were PPE shortages, is if that, you know, you don't have access to N95s, um, a face shield can be helpful for um, additional protection with the surgical mask underneath. Um, so they can be useful in that scenario. And then the other question uh, was about whether or not staff should be fit tested, I believe. And um, we definitely recommend that whenever possible, if you are gonna be using um, 95s to make sure that the staff are fit tested, to make sure they're using one that um, works for their face shape and um, you know, that they're properly trained on how to take on and, and, and off the, the face mask. Um, so 
and especially for people that are going to be working around the animals that we know are susceptible. Great, thank you. Wonderful. We're going to um, jump to a new question. This might be a surprise for the panelists. We'll see. So um, the question, and Dr. Sleeman, I'm going to start you off, but if others would like to chime in as, in well, as well, that would be great. And have we noted any transmission same species once infected from a human source, or is this solely a human to non-human uh, pathogen? Yeah, yeah so the the vast majority, if not all of the cases that, that we've seen in animals, both domestic and wild, have a human origin for, for infection. Um, now in white-tailed deer, with that recent study in Iowa, they did uh, phylogenetic sequencing and, and analysis to demonstrate there was likely multiple uh, introductions of the virus from people, but also um, henceforth, deer-to-deer -deer transmission or ongoing transmission. So that's uh, kind of the first real scientific evidence I've seen of, of ongoing uh, within species transmission after initial human, human introduction um, of the virus. I, I can't comment on about the, the situations in, in, in captive species. So I think it's obviously based on that study in deer possible um, and something to be considered in the management of these cases in zoos. Um, and I don't know whether anybody else on the panel want to, wanted to comment on any situations in, in, the, in, in, in captive animals. I think the one that we have the best information on is farm mink. Um, so in those situations, it's, um, it's usually a human exposure. And then we have really good evidence that it's spreading through the mink um, like wildfire. So that's another example. Um, we have um, some evidence um, in companion animals that that might be the case within households um, as well. But certainly, I think the strongest examples are the one Dr. Sleeman mentioned, as well as um, on mink farms. Yeah, I think there's been some suspicion, but there's not a lot of in the way of, of, of hard evidence. It's difficult to prove because especially like it, in the, for example, in the outbreak that Dr. Chinadori mentioned, you have a situation where all of those cats are probably being taken care of by the same keepers. So they have the same human exposure. So it's really difficult to determine. Great, thank, thank you everyone. Uh, Dr. Terrio, I'm going to stay on you uh, for a question or two, and, and I'll read them both at the same time. This came in from one person. So what thoughts are there on the lack of reported infections in non-domestic canids? And also, are there any thoughts on the lack of reported infections in pinnipeds, which are often in close proximity and have close interaction with human caregivers? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot we don't know is the bottom line. Uh, there is certainly computer mod modeling that has shown that some of these other species are very, could be potentially susceptible to the virus. Um, but certainly we also know that from some of those computer models, they had some species such as the felid and the mink at lower risk. So those computer models in, the, in and of themselves are not infallible and, and, and not always you know, correct. There probably are combinations of things between um, individual host innate susceptibility to the virus in combination with animal behaviors and human behaviors. So how are we interacting with them, but also how do they interact with their environment and other and, and, and sources and so how to that that probably play a role in, in why we're seeing so many felid um, cases and we haven't seen cases in non domestic canids. Um, and we've seen relatively fewer cases in, in apes too. Great, thank you. Um, this next one is going to come to you, Dr. Howard. And um, the question is, has there been any consideration of giving a human COVID vaccine to apes, especially with the potentially limiting immunity response to the mink vaccine so far? Yeah, I think there's two aspects to this question. The first one, as veterinarians, do we think the vaccine would work? Probably. We just vaccinated all our apes with human flu vaccine. We use polio, we use measles. So would it work? Probably. Might it work, create a higher response than Zoetis? Maybe. Um, so from a veterinary perspective, I wouldn't hesitate. The second part of that's the big part is, is it the right thing to do in this, in this point in time in, in the pandemic and with the vaccine situation across the world? 
And at, at San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, we felt very strongly that using human vaccines for our animals was a no-go right now. It's, it's not the right thing to do. Um, in the future, when the COVID vaccine is as available as the flu vaccine, heck yeah, we'd probably use it. Um, but, but right now, it just um, doesn't seem like the right thing to do in this climate. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, um, Jonathan's gonna do the next question because I think it came into him and I didn't see it. So go for it. Yeah, sure. So there's been a couple of questions coming up regarding the use of fecal samples for PCR testing and the efficacy of, of that method. I don't know if anybody would like to, 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 to respond to those questions. Is it, you know, the questions are, is it as effective as nasal swabs? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Howard. Um, I know Karen can give you a lot more science, um, but just for us, when we had our gorilla down, we were able to get paired nasal and fecal swabs. This was seven days into his clinical experience and the fecal swabs were almost negative and the nasal swab was crazy positive. So there's, it probably the correlation varies. I will, I do wanna mention though, in our vaccinated animals that then became positive, the amount of shedding in the feces was a lot lower, um, the C, which means the CT values were higher, if I can remember my math right. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If you do have vaccinated animals that are showing clinical signs, it's a better chance you'll, you'll miss the positive fecals if you wait too long or, or stretch out your, your testing. Similar to people who are vaccinated, they might still shed the virus, but obviously a lot, a lot less. And I'll let Karen um, actually do the science on that. <laughs> I'll let Rhea go first. Do you have something you were gonna say, Rhea? Oh, sure. Yeah, I was just gonna provide a little bit of data that we have from um, companion animals specifically. Um, so where we have, quite a lot more data than we do in um, zoo animals. So in those instances, what we typically end up seeing is um, nasal swabs and oral swabs tend to be quite comparable in terms of CT values and sensitivity and specificity. Um, fecal samples tend to be a little um, less sensitive and they tend to detect infection a little later on. Um, so they're a little, nasal swabs tend to be better at detecting infection um, kind of right as it's coming on. And then fecal samples from what we've seen um, tend to have kind of a longer duration, presumably kind of as the virus is passing through the gastrointestinal tract, um, they end up being positive for quite a bit longer than nasal and oral swabs, um, but not, not quite at that initial onset. Yeah, I mean, that's along the lines of what I was going to say is that we're starting to see from the, I mean, we've been able to do additional testing from the, unfortunately, the mortalities and see that sort of where the virus, the sort of progression of infection does change as to where it is located in the body. And, and that may also drive what's, you know, what's going to be positive or not. There may be a time when the lung is positive, but the nasal is not. Um, we don't have enough data to say that for certain, but that's certainly, you know, something that would be in line with other species that have been studied. Um, then the fecal PCR, it's available. It's a benefit to us in the zoological community because it's a sample we can collect and we're collecting. We're picking them up anyway. So it's something that we can collect non-invasively if your animals are either not trained to do the nasal swabs or are also in, clinically, you know, you're not wanting to, to immobilize the animals just to get the sample for testing, so. Great, thanks folks. So thanks Dr. Dean for uh, leading that uh, Q&A session and, and thanks again to all the panelists for, for answering all those questions as well, as well as all for the excellent presentations. It's been a, been a really good session. So before we end, we wanted to pass it over to Dr. Laurie Gage um, from the USDA who has a brief annou announcement about an upcoming study that may be of interest and then we will, we will wrap up. Hi Dr. everybody, uh, it was a wonderful session today. Just wanted to let you all know that USDA, we have funding now um, and we're looking to uh, start a, a project that we've uh, named the ZABRAS project, which simply stands for Zoo and Aquaria Biosecurity Risk Assessment with SARS-CoV-2 Serology. And I think we have a slide that will show the contact information if you're interested in, in uh, this project. Uh, it's gonna be a three-pronged approach. 